Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate day number 897, 897, Saturday, September 14th, 2019. Thank you so much for tuning in. Okay, so I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to spend uh, hardly any time at all on this uh, first thing, uh, the demo commie debate from last night. Uh, I'm sure every one of you tuned in. <laughs> not. No, I didn't tune in. I watched uh, kind of like the highlights of it today, if you can call it that. Uh, there's no real, real need for me to tune into that anymore. Uh, I, I realized after the first debate, I, I couldn't even watch even a third of the second debate because there's really nothing new. I already know what they all believe in, what they're all going to talk about, uh, and all these sorts of things. So there's not really any need for me to tune in other than for entertainment, uh, watching these people make fools of themselves. Other than that, I'm just too busy uh, to waste my time on that. Um, but I'm sure some of you may have watched it uh, just for comic relief, but uh, it doesn't appear that anything happened that we didn't expect. Biden made a lot of gaffes, uh, looked awfully bad. Kamala Harris is a disaster. Uh, Warren and Bernie are taking care of each other. Uh, and you got a few people picking it around the edges on each other, trying to get some attention. There's really, but as far as the substance of where do they stand on the, on, on the issues, what are their policy proposals and all these things. We already know all of that. So, you know, I, there's nothing new coming out of these debates at all. And I guess, um, I guess just from watching the first debate, uh, about half or a little less than half of the second debate, watching some highlights after that, and then watching sort of the highlights, reading a couple of news stories today about, the, about you know, what transpired, I, I think the biggest question for me uh, over these past three debates is not so much what they discussed policy-wise and debated on policy-wise, but, but what they have not wanted to talk about in these three debates. As you've probably noticed, they have not seemed to be very interested at all in talking about the economy, talking about their ideas for what they would do uh, to have a strong economy. You don't hear them talking about any of the things that affect the economy. Uh, monetary policy, trade, uh, just general economics, uh, other than taxes, and then they all want to raise our taxes, but other than that, that's not economic policy, but th they really don't want to seem to focus very much on economics, and that's the most important issue in every election to every voter, um, most, most voters. Um, they also, as you've noticed, uh, you know, over the past three debates, they really don't want to bring up and talk very much about the abortion issue. They don't want to talk about the abortion issue very much. So, again, I have to say, after the this debate, it's like the last two debates, the big winner is obviously Trump. He's the biggest winner. And the biggest loser, again, is Obama because it's Obama's legacy that's being trashed. I bet you Obama's not even watching these debates. And if he is, he's got steam coming out of his ears because he kind of thought that he was this godlike figure, uh, the new face of the Democratic Party. Uh, and now it's just, he's not even been gone four years. He's looking back and his, his eight years are being trashed. His administration is being trashed. And the, and the reason he didn't want Biden running is because Biden cannot adequately defend uh, those eight years. And the worst guy in the world you could have out there trying to defend uh, Obama is Biden. <laughs> but that's who's out there. So my guess is, is that Obama probably could, couldn't even sit through uh, this entire debate. And of course, I'll tell you who, who is watching these debates very closely. <laughs> the rotten Reverend Clinton. Oh, yes. The Rotten Reverend is just sitting there watching, and she's laughing her head off. She's laughing so hard because she knows, she knows that there's not a single person on that stage that's electable. And quite honestly, um, having debated Trump, she probably knows that Trump could walk up on that stage with those 10 Democrats and defeat every single one of them by himself. If Trump would have walked up on that stage last night and jumped into that debate, he would have beat all 10 of They could have ganged up on him, 10 against one, and he would have destroyed the entire field of them right there, all at once, 10 on one, and he would have blown them out of the water. That's how bad these, that's how bad these guys are. I just, I cannot believe that any of these people are going to be the Democratic nominee. Uh, I, I just, it's, I, I, I'm thinking it's, 
it should happen. I mean, that's what's supposed to happen, but something else has got to give because, you know, I just don't think there's a single person on that stage unless the Democrats just absolutely want to get destroyed. I mean, Trump won 30 states in 2016. Uh, the very best any of those Democrats on, uh, that, that we're watching right now could do, Trump would win probably 30, um, 40. He would win probably 40 states. He won 30 in 2016. He could probably win 40 in 2020 with this group here. And if it's someone like a Bernie or maybe even a Biden, he could win 42, 45 states. So uh, it's going to be a blowout. If, it, if we're looking at the Democratic field, if, one, if the nominee is going to come out of that field of 10, then they're going to get absol absolutely smoked. And the rotten Reverend Clinton knows this. The corporate Democratic Party donors know this. Uh, the criminals on Wall Street know this. They all know it. And even though the Rotten Reverend would lose probably even more since she did in 2016, at least ways, um, at least ways they wouldn't take the party completely off the cliff, because that's where this party is going. It's going. It's completely. It's like it's like AOC is driving the crazy the, the crazy bus, and they're all on it, and she's driving the bus right over the cliff, and they're all going down with her. They're and they're happy to do so. And I think probably the most surprising thing to me when you watch the left-wing media outlets when they after the debates and are talking about all this, they still haven't put two and two together yet. They still haven't figured out why all 10 of these people, including Biden in a lot of ways, are going so hard left, especially the other nine other than Biden. Why are they going so hard left when they know these are untenable positions, knowing that you cannot get elected running on these things? And the only thing I can think of uh, as I've mentioned before, is that they all believe that you've got, in order to be the Democratic nominee, you've got to get the endorsement of Ocasio-Cortez. She is the kingmaker. She's got 5 million Twitters, Twitter followers. And I swear, that's what it looks like to me. It looks like to me that everyone in that on that stage believes that they absolutely must get the endorsement of AOC or their toast. And the person who gets the endorsement of AOC is going to get her 5 million Twitter followers. <laughs> and that's what it looks like to me. Uh, it appears that they're all vying for the love and support and the endorsement of AOC. And she keeps teasing, saying, yeah, well, here pretty soon she's going to start naming some names uh, of people she's endorsing for Congress and a presidential uh, nominee. Uh, as well. So everyone's trying to get the AOC endorsement and I think that that's who they're all playing to right now. And she's going to take that entire Democratic Party along with her uh, three uh, uh, three horsewomen of the apocalypse along with her. They're all going to drive the bus right over the cliff and the entire Democratic Party is in the bus with them. Happy to do it. Happy to do it. <laughs> so, you know, that's what it looks like to me. But yeah, I thought the funniest clip I saw was the clip where Biden's teeth actually start coming loose <laughs> and he's asked a question and just when he's getting ready to answer the question, it's like you can see his teeth are all over his mouth and he's trying to get his teeth back in, in place. It's kind of funny. But um, anyway, yeah, that that's what I make of it. You know, nothing new, nothing to be learned. It's the same stuff. It's just, um, I'm just waiting for uh, the Democratic Party to, and I think they already realize this, to, to come to their senses and realize there's no one on that stage that can get anywhere near Trump. And unless they want to get absolutely destroyed in 2020, they're going to have to do something else. And I and like I said, I only see three possible people who could throw their hat in uh, this late in the game and have access to the money uh, and, has, and has name recognition and still has a organization or could put together an organization that could... Uh, maybe compete. And I think the number one most likely, of course, is the Rotten Reverend Clinton. She meets all of the above criteria. Then you've got Bloomberg. He doesn't have any organization or anything yet, but he's got all the money. And then you've got Kerry. And of course, Kerry doesn't really have, he can, he can get access to quite a bit of money. Um, but, and, and he does have some, some name recognition, but he doesn't have any organization built up around him or anything like that. So, Anyway, I still think the Rotten Reverend Clinton is ultimately uh, going to be the nominee. But if she's not, then uh, I don't see how Biden hangs on. It will probably end up being Warren. But I, I, I just, I just can't imagine that that's who they're going to go with. I just something just tells me it just it's, 
it just that it just cannot happen. So we're all going to find out, aren't we? It won't be that long either. Alrighty. Well, it looks like today we learned here today on Friday that uh, Attorney General Barr does now have Inspector General Huckleberry Horowitz's report and is now going through the review and classification process. I thought he had it a couple weeks ago, but apparently not. Apparently he just got it yesterday and it's now going through the review and classification process and we know that takes about uh, three, four weeks. So we can expect sometime, I would assume, uh, the end of September, maybe early October, we'll finally see the IG report, which I understand is going to be very damning. Um, but we had John Solomon on uh, Lou Dobbs telling him that he believes that Barr may release, Attorney General Barr may release a, a bunch of these buckets of documents ahead of the release of the IG report. And that would be very good. They need to release it all, get it all out. Now I know that Durham is doing his investigation and so there's certain things that they would want to release because it's, it's part of his investigation. I understand that, but uh, they should release everything they possibly can. Well, it looks like we've uncovered more lies from the rotten Reverend Clinton, uh, which should not surprise us. Um, so Clinton and uh, Abedin and all those other people, Cheryl Mills, her lawyers and all the rest around the rotten Reverend all had stated previously that Clinton stopped using her ClintonMail.com uh, illegal uh, email setup, that she quit using that when she uh, left her term as Secretary of State. Her Clinton ClintonMail.com account she stopped using, the which was being run on her illegal private server, her private email uh, system, were told and by Clinton and her acolytes that they stopped using that when she left her position as Secretary of State. But now we know that that was a lie. They were all lying. Clinton, Podesta, Abedin, Cheryl Mills, and others were using that Clinton email.com address even after the IG announced their investigation, which was back in March, uh, March the 15th of 26, uh, 2015. And we now know that she was using, along with all of her friends, Podesta, Abedin, Cheryl Mills, and others, were using that email as late as March the 30th of 2015. In other words, up until the day before, she bleach bitted uh, all those emails, which was on March 31st of 2015. Yep, more damning evidence against the rotten Reverend Clinton, but she doesn't care. She doesn't care. Now, as we follow this uh, latest development with uh, Andy McCabe, uh, and we know now that he's almost certainly facing uh, indictments. They will reconvene this grand jury. Uh, they'll present the evidence to them. I find it very difficult to believe, based on the preponderance of the evidence, that the jury can come back with anything other than a uh, verdict to indict. In a grand jury proceeding, you only need 12 of 23 jurors to... Uh, vote in the affirmative to indict. And the evidence against him is overwhelming and it's not coming from Trump or anyone like that. It's from the FBI's own internal um, group that looked at McCabe's situation, the Office of Professional Responsibility. It also was uh, through the IG, uh, the Inspector General of the FBI, through his investigation. So it has nothing to do with Trump or anything like that. This was purely from the FBI and the DOJ's own resources. This is their findings. And of course the Department of Justice lawyer uh, at this point who it looks like Jesse Liu and her team which would be making the case to the grand jury. So I see no way that McCabe does, does not get 
uh, the grand jury to come back uh, and uh, affirm that he should be indicted. Um, but the thing that we talked about here is it's, it's almost certain, everybody knows that when you have something like this and you know it's a big investigation, there's going to be a lot more people being called, called out, many more probably grand juries, many more indictments coming down, things and such. McCabe knows this. His lawyers know this. Uh, the DOJ prosecutors know this. Everybody knows this, okay, unless you're living under a rock. Uh, if you've been following this investigation, you know that there's more coming. And so under those circumstances, and if you're McCabe, you know there's much more coming for, you know, he knows there's much more coming for him because he was also involved in the FISA stuff. He's also involved in the spies. He's also involved in the coup. He's also involved in the 25th Amendment, the wearing the wire. You name it, McCabe was up to his eyeballs in all of it. This is just the small potatoes, and he knows it. So when you're in that situation, your attorneys are going to say, hey, I think you need to cut a deal. And so that's why I do believe that it's, at this point, probably a little better than 50-50, if not much better than 50-50, that McCabe uh, is going to cut a deal. He is going to agree to cooperate and give up some information, but he's going to have to give up some pretty big players uh, in order to get himself off the hook, because, or he's going to have to give them something they don't already have. And my guess is they've got an awful lot. So he's going to have to give them something really, really good in order to get himself off the hook. But something else we have to keep in mind here is that if you remember uh, about, I think it was last summer, maybe even before that, that Comey uh, in an interview said, hey, you know, I may be willing to, I may be asked to testify against McCabe. And he was, and he was asking, you know, is that something that you, you, you would have to do? And he's like, oh, yeah, well, I'm, I may have to testify against Andy McCabe. And you, sure, I would, I would testify against Andy McCabe if, if I had to. Because remember, M McCabe's first excuse was that uh, regarding the leak, the leak of the story he did, the first thing he was saying was, hey, it was an illegal leak. Lisa Page seems to be siding with him on this. Not an illegal leak because it was authorized. Essentially, McCabe was trying to say that Comey authorized him to do these leaks and that Comey knew about everything he was doing. But then when Comey is questioned about it, Comey says, no, nah, I, didn't, I didn't give McCabe the liberty to, uh, or the authority or the order or anything else or the approval to leak this information or any other information. So here we have McCabe and Comey at odds. McCabe and Comey are clearly at odds about over whether Comey knew about McCabe's leaking. McCabe says he did know. Comey says he did not. And we also know that Comey has said publicly in a TV interview. You can watch it on YouTube. He says, yes, I've, I've, I may have to te testify against Andy McCabe. And yes, I've, I would testify against Andy McCabe. So here's McCabe. He's sitting there. He's about to become indicted. He's still trying, tr sticking with his story that Comey knew. Who do you think that McCabe is going to try to give up? <laughs> he, it's probably Comey. I would think. I would think McCabe will probably tell his lawyers to go talk to the prosecutors. And say, hey, my client's willing to give you Comey, serving him up on a silver platter. Now, my guess is, the prosecutors may say, well, we don't really need any help with Comey on a silver platter. The, five, the uh, IG report's coming out very soon. Durham's got his investigation going. Just from what we already know, uh, Comey's in a lot of trouble on the FISA, on lying to the FISA court. He's also in trouble on some other things. We don't really need any help with Comey. We don't really need any help with Comey. No, thank you. At which point, McCabe will, be have, to, will have to shoot higher. Well, how about if I give you Yates? He can give you Yates, too. Well... She signed off on the FISA also, and she was involved in the Michael Flynn setup. So we've, we've got her, her goose cooked as well. We don't need any help with her either. What else she got? And he'll keep working his way up the chain. If McCabe can deliver a big head like someone at the cabinet level position, a Susan Rice, Loretta Lynch, or possibly Obama himself, if he could deliver that, or Hillary Clinton, um... That would probably be a deal that they would talk about. But I think if it's anybody cap below cabinet level, if it's, if it's Lynch, I, I mean, if it's uh, Comey, uh, if it's Yates, if it's, you know, anyone uh, below cabinet level, I, I don't think they'll cut the deal with him. I really don't. They don't need his help. 
uh, they don't need his help to take out Strzok or Page or, or Baker or or Rybicki or Comey or Yates or any of these people. They, they're they all cooked anyway. Mary Moyer, the whole nine yards. Carlin, John Carlin, uh, you know. So they don't need his help with any of them people. If if Andy wants to cut a deal, he's going to have to serve up something really good and he's going to have to have some hard evidence because his word is no longer good. I mean, it's a he said, he said with he and Comey. Who are you going to believe? They're both pathological liars. Who are you going to believe? McCabe's word is no good. He would have to produce some emails, some telephone calls, something. He'd have to produce some hard evidence, and he would have to give up somebody cabinet level uh, or higher. That's my thoughts on that. But McCabe and all the rest of these perpetrators, they know one thing. They know the guy, the first guy to get the deal, gets the best deal. Everybody else is sucking wind. Okay, speaking again of uh, Ocasio-Cortez, the wild-eyed commie, she's made another completely ridiculous comment about climate change. She says now that Miami will not exist in a few years. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, Miami will not exist in a few years. Well, you know, uh, no, Miami's going to be around for a very long time. Um, so, um, at least until the next Ice Age. Don't think the ice age. Don't think the ice will make it down to Miami, but um, anyway, uh, you know, it seems funny that she would be talking about Miami, but she's not talking about any of the Caribbean islands or the Keys because the Keys are actually going to the Keys will actually disappear long before Miami does. Uh, so will some of them Caribbean islands. Um, but um, anyway, Miami will not exist in a few years. That's just crazy talk. It's the same stuff that Al Gore was saying. I remember back. In the early 2000s or late 90s, yeah, late 90s, Al Gore saying that by by the year 20, think I forget what it was, 2012, I think he said, it was like 10 or 12 year prediction he put out, there would be no more polar bears, there would be no more ice caps on the North and South Poles, there would be, I mean, uh, he, uh, entire cities on the East Coast would be underwater. I mean, I remember all that crazy stuff. Go back and look at it for yourself. Google it up and, and look at the, the predictions that Al Gore made back in the late 90s. And, and, and he was, and he was even more. He was at least halfway sane. AOC is nuts. I mean, this is just crazy talk. And this is the person that every Democrat running for president right now believes they have to have the support of to win the nomination. <laughs> like I said, she's driving it right off the cliff. John Solomon has new documents. He also has some sources who he's been speaking with. He appeared on both Lou Dobbs and Sean Hannity and Laura Ingram, I think, all three, to bring us the following information. And he says this, a lot of what he's uh, discovered here in the last 24 hours or so is a special thanks to Chuck Grassley and Ron Johnson for the inquiry that they've been doing about some things that went on at the State Department, particularly that meeting where Christopher Steele met with Kathleen Kavalik about 18 days before they got the first FISA warrant. And that meeting, of course, was set up by Jonathan Weiner. So Solomon is saying that the State Department Inspector General, the State Department Inspector General found evidence of anti-Trump political conduct in the meeting between Steele and Kavalik. And he has referred one person to the Office of Special Counsel for Hatch Act violations. <clears throat> the State Department Inspector General has found evidence of anti-Trump political conduct that occurred in the meeting between Christopher Steele and Kathleen Kavalik. He has referred one person to the Office of Special Counsel for Hatch Act violations. And of course, you can bet that Barr has tucked that one into his pocket too, and we'll probably pass it along to Durham. We also learned from John Solomon that Jonathan Weiner, one of Hillary's henchmen, was using non-official email to conduct official State Department business during the time that he was communicating with Christopher Steele and Glenn Simpson. Jonathan Weiner 
using non-official email account, a non-official email account to conduct official State Department business during the time that he was communicating with Christopher Steele and Glenn Simpson. And clearly he was communicating with Kathleen Kavalik and other people at the State Department, likely communicating with the rotten Reverend Clinton, possibly her lawyer. Uh, who, who, who knows? Uh, Victoria Newland, almost certainly Victoria Newland, he would have been talking to her. So there's a lot to look at there. But we learn also from John Solomon that, and this is what Grassley and Johnson discovered. After Johnson and Grassley discovered the two things I just mentioned, they then discover that this State Department Inspector General never interviewed any of the key players concerning the previously uh, mentioned uh, two revelations, leading Grassley and Johnson to suspect a cover-up. Now, the State Department Inspector General is a guy named Steve Linick, L-I-N-I-C-K. He's an Obama appointee to that position, been there since 2013. You can Wikipedia him, and there's just not much there. Not much there. He's just a bureaucrat that's been around for a while. Is basically it. Now, Grassley and Johnson have sent uh, Linick a two-page letter asking him why. Why did he never interview or investigate Newland, Kavalek, or Weiner? Considering his own State Department, his own IG working for him, he's the head, he's the IG. His team finds the two things that we just talked about. Yet he does not have them interview Newland, Kavalik, or Weiner, the principal players. Not only that, he does not even produce a report of his findings. Looks a lot like a cover-up. So, now Grassley and Johnson are passing this along to Attorney General Barr, who will pass it along to Durham, and uh, they're going to be probably, I would assume they might have some hearings and call Mr. Lennick in and ask him why after discovering the two violations and even referring uh, people to uh, the Office of Special Counsel why he did not do any follow-up himself, no interviews or file no report or bring it to the attention of Congress, who has oversight. It looks like he's covering things up, or just not doing his job. That's what it looks like. He's either covering up, or he's just not doing his job. My oh my. So yeah, now we finally do get, a, a, I guess you could say official word, that Barr does have the IG report. Uh, we keep hearing it's going to be very damning. I, I do believe it is. Um, we already know pretty much because Gowdy, Nunez, and um, Ratcl or not, uh, yeah, Ratcliffe have all three seen pretty much all the documents relating to the FISA warrant. They've all pretty much said, they have not come out with the exact specific wording, but they've pretty much gone on enough TV shows over the past year to tell us that having looked at all that, they know that pretty much it was the steel uh, material, so-called steel material, that was used uh, to get the FISA on Carter Page. And the only thing that's even more troubling than that is it looks like the corroborating evidence that they used for the so-called steel dossier was the Shearer dossier, <laughs> which all came from the same source. Fusion GPS, Nellie Orr, the Rotten Reverend Clinton, and her cronies. So, yes, I do believe that um, from what we know, uh, unless there's something else that we haven't heard about, but if there was, Nunez and Gowdy and Ratcliffe would have mentioned it, and they have not. They all keep saying the exact same thing, and it's been going on for a very long time now. So I think we can, uh, we can pretty well take it to the bank, as well as what we've heard from John Solomon, who obviously knows someone, who knows someone in the Inspector General's office because he's getting this information, and he's saying, hey, it's going to be very damning. And if it clearly shows uh, and lays out exactly what we believe it's going to show us, there's, again, just in the case of McCabe, there's absolutely no way that the people who signed off 
on that FISA application, of which there were, I think, either nine or 11 different people signing off on all four, the first one being the worst, and that's the one that Comey signed off on. Rodenstein signed off on the last one. Sally Yates signed off on one. Uh, Loretta Lynch says she never signed off on any of them and doesn't even know anything about it. We'll find out how true that is. So um, you have all these people signing off. Everyone who signed off on any of those four Carter Page FISA warrants should be indicted. And when you, when you, there's not just one crime here. There are multiple violations, criminal violations, in the one act of, of the FISA uh, situation. Because you're, you, you, you withheld exculpatory information. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a crime. You lied to the FISA court. That's perjury in the FISA court. That's a separate crime. It's an abuse of power. Then you can get into denying uh, the civil rights to the person involved. That would be Carter Page. Uh, then you have the larger conspiracy surrounding it. There's probably a half a dozen violations just uh, on every individual who signed their name on that FISA warrant because it says you are signing under penalty of perjury that the information that you are submitting to the court is the God's honest truth. That is true, that it is verified, you have, you have checked it, you've verified it, you've made sure it is correct. That's what you're telling the FISA court. And you're also telling the FISA court that there's no other uh, uh, information that would bring that into question. So these, this is a massive fraud on the FISA court. And there's, like I said, anywhere from three, four, five, six different uh, criminal offenses you can find in the criminal code uh, that would be covered under that one act of, of, of fraud on the FISA court. And that, again, there's nine or 11, I forget exactly the number, it's either nine or 11 different people all signed off on the FISA warrant. So. Uh, I do believe that once this comes out, that we will see indictments against these individuals uh, on this, and it's very possible that we're going to see some fairly high-level people shaken up in the early process, and that once you shake these people up, uh, it's like shaking a tree, everything else comes down, at which point Durham his investigation will begin to move much and much more uh, much quicker because bringing down two or three top people at the FBI or DOJ is like shaking the tree. It's going to shake a lot of things out. A lot of things will start to come down, they'll fall in place and um, I think then ultimately what you end up with is a Durham report that picks up the pieces, fills in the gaps and I think by that time you will have enough people who have come forward falling on the sword uh, ho hoping to cop a plea agreement, uh, hoping to uh, get reduced charges or something like that. And, and I still stick with my original uh, statement, which I've made months ago, that I think that there will be dozens, dozens of people, several, I think two to three dozen uh, people will be indicted just in the initial first wave. And then I think that there could be additional fallout after that that could go on for probably two or three years. Uh, and you can still see some people uh, coming up on the radar screen because um, this is going to take a while to sort out. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll be back tomorrow with more Towergate. You guys have a good night. See you. Bye.